Hey everyone, welcome to our week 14, modules 73 and 74 after school review. We're gonna go through our practice problems as we cover things like kind of pay discrimination, module 73, and then get into our introduction into markets with externalities or natural market failures. So I already asked the class what they wanna cover. The first thing they wanted is number three. What is efficiency wages? That is a good thing to know and define. Remember, efficiency wages, when I pay my workers above the market wage rate, so they stay loyal to me, maybe work a little hard so they don't lose a job. Um, and it's inefficient because as I pay my workers more, I will hire fewer workers. If you have that done, most questions fall within the realm of that concept. So an efficient wage describes a wage rate that is equal marginal factor cost. Now, that would be an efficient wage is efficient because exactly you will the wage rate apply by the marginal productivity theory it isn't it's above that it's termed by collective bargaining nope equal marginal burden of product labor adjusted so to make the structure competition or equal no above the equilibrium wage and is paid in order to provide workers with incentive to perform efficiently so it's inefficient though you guys got it cool all right the next one we're covering too we're skipping all the way to 11. it's gonna be a good day for Marginal social benefit of pollution. Hey, why do we pollute? Why do we do things that pollute? Some of you guys are doing it right now. You get benefit from it. If you're just like, hey, should I pollute for the sake of polluting? I think every single one of us would think what? No, thank you. No reason to do that thing. Okay. So it's because we get benefit from doing so. All right. Hopefully it's good benefit and stuff. But the marginal social benefit of pollution, let's see, is zero, rarely is it zero, uh, can be measured as additional gain society from one additional unit of pollution. Yeah, there you go. I pollute, and how much benefit did I get from that extra unit of pollution? A ton of CO2 or ton of trash. We can go ahead and say we get this much benefit from those things. Any questions? Yeah. What is the... Um definition of pollution in this context? Uh, what's the definition of pollution? Um, I like to think of it as, you know how we have goods, things we produce that have value to society, like anything that could be bought? Uh, I like to think of pollution as a bad. It's something we produce that no one wants. In fact, people would pay money to not get. Um, so essentially whatever you define pollution as, you know, emissions, toxic sludge, trash, noise pollution, smell pollution, those can all fit in this definition. So we're not going, what is pollution? There's not a class on that definition. It's kind of any dictionary definition tends to work. Is that good? Okay. Any other questions? Being said, all right, we'll move into our next set. All right, we're going right into this, socially optimal quantity of pollution. And we already know the socially optimal quantity of pollution will always be where? Not when the marginal cost equals marginal revenue, there's an externality. So we need to include the what cost? Social cost. The social cost. So it's the marginal social cost equals a marginal social benefit or revenue. It could be both. So marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. So right here, that would be our socially optimal quantity and price for the good. You guys understand, we don't ignore costs to find socially optimal. We need to take them all into account. And remember, social marginal social cost is a marginal private cost. That would be our typical supply curve in the market. We added on to it the external cost and society. Marginal social benefit is the marginal private benefit, the demand curve in a market, add on the external benefits that could be with a positive externality, never both at the same time. So we got this easy enough graph. So the socially optimal quantity of pollution in the figure without government intervention. Okay, so remember, if there's pollution, what kind of externality do we have in the market, positive or negative? Negative. It's it's just obvious. So. so without government intervention, will we be at the optimal price and quantity? No. no. 
In fact, a negative externality means in an unregulated market, we will consume how much of the good? Too much. You guys all understand that? So a dead weight loss will exist. Well, this one's simple because we're not really into the graphing and we will get into the graphing because the marginal social cost of pollution equals, nope, there would be no dead weight loss there. Dead loss because marginal benefit exceeds the cost. No, nope, the cost will exceed the benefit. We'll do too much. Essentially, what you want to do here is remember in class, when you drew that supply curve, the marginal private uh, cost. If you draw that there, here, I'll give you guys a, a, a look at it. So if we had our supply curve, which is our marginal private cost, that would be here. So in an unregulated market, this would be our equilibrium. And we'd be at this quantity instead of what would be the optimal quantity. Does that make sense to you guys? So this is socially optimal. This is where we're at. Make sense? So supply didn't shift. Supply is what the market would be. So remember today we drew our graphs and I said demand is marginal private benefit. And since there's no positive externality, private benefit equals social benefit. Cool. So that's our demand curve. We don't need to mess with it. There's just a negative externality. And I started with the supply curve and said it was marginal private cost. And I said, if we add the social cost, we add another curve over to here. That's what I just did. You're like, why did I shift supply? Actually, supply is there. It's got to go back. Okay, so we will be here. That is not optimal because at this point, the marginal social benefit is down here. What is the marginal social cost? Greater. Does that make sense, guys? So now we go back to the options. Deadweight loss will exist because the marginal social cost of pollution exceeds marginal social benefit of pollution. We're consuming too much, but the cost now in society outweighs the benefit. You guys good? Ready for the next one then? Should be easier. In the figure, the optimal quantity of pollution could be achieved where marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. So it's not there. Achieve only with market forces? No, because this is a natural market failure. Could be achieved with the coast, with the coast theorem only if transaction costs are sufficiently high. No, no, no. What's the rule for Coase theorem? Transaction costs must be low. So that's just a red herring for you. Could be achieved the marginal social benefit pollution shifted outward. No, that shouldn't work. Could be achieved with the Coase theorem if property rights are clearly defined and transaction costs are low. That is a weird question, but that's just how the Coase theorem works. All right, so let's go ahead. I'll just cover the Coase theorem for you guys. Famous economist, Coase, Nobel laureate, did good stuff with this. What he said is, if there's particularly a negative externality in the market, you can reach a socially optimal outcome. The market will reach a socially optimal outcome so long as two things occur. Transaction costs are low and property rights are clearly defined. So an example is if I'm a big factory that pollutes on the top of a hill and you guys are a bunch of people who live in the valley below and I pollute and all my pollution runs off and it makes a bad smell to you guys. That smell to you guys costs you $70,000 of unhappiness. Easy enough. But I gain $100,000 of benefit creating that pollution. So I make $100,000 of benefit. It costs you guys $70,000 of cost. Everyone with me? What is the optimal solution? What would be best for society? No. Me to keep what? Polluting. You guys to move or endure. Because the benefit outweighs the cost. Does that make sense to you guys? That's the optimal outcome. So, so long as his... Uh, Property rights are clearly defined and transaction costs are low. That will occur. So let me explain. If property rights are clearly defined, as in a judge goes and says, Wildsmith, your factory is allowed to produce, pollute. These people have no right to tell you not to. Clearly defined property rights. I have the right to pollute. You don't have the right to tell me. Well, then what am I going to do? 
keep polluting. That's the optimal outcome. Okay, what if you guys have the property rights? You're allowed clearly to make me stop polluting and I have to if you tell me to. Okay, will we get to the socially optimal outcome? Yes, because I make $100,000 profit and cost you 70. I could pay you guys $70,000 to endure the smell or move or whatever the $70,000 gets you. Maybe 71,000 so you're a little bit better off. And if transaction costs are low, would you guys take that? Here's your cost. You get the same or a little more benefit. Good deal for you. Make sense? And I keep polluting. Socially optimal outcome achieved. Okay, let me explain how the transaction costs and property rights could make this whole thing work. What if I say I have the right to pollute? I was here first. And you guys go, no, you're making us suffer. You can't do this to us. And the courts are like, I don't know. Well, am I going to stop polluting because you tell me to? Uh, you guys going to just have to, are you guys going to be happy and make income if you had the right to stop me? No, we'll just argue the whole time and maybe you find a way to shut me down. Maybe I don't. That's not good. So you guys all understand? Ill-defined property rights means we just fight over it and don't try to achieve a good outcome. So you need those property rights to say who is the right and then proceed. Make sense? Secondly, what if transaction costs were high? So there's many of you guys living out of town below. And instead of me talking to you guys all at once, which would be a low transaction cost, I talk to one group, you guys agree or disagree, we come to a solution that is low transaction costs. What if I had to deal with each of you individually and get each of you to sign off on my plan? Would that be a difficult for me to do? I could get a bunch of you guys to agree to the $70,000 deal, but some of you guys might go, no, he needs us all. And so instead of asking for $70,000, you'd ask for what? More and more, $100,000, $200,000. I'll take whatever I can possibly get. And then, well, will I make that deal now? No, because now my costs are too high. That transaction cost is too difficult to get everyone to agree. And therefore, could the Coast Theorem fail? Yeah, one person be like, shut them down, don't care. And we're not at our optimal outcome. So you guys understand? Transaction costs are the cost of making the agreement. And property rights are who has the right to do the thing or not do the thing. You guys understand? So I say, what are the odds you're going to live around someone in apartments in college who is a really bad neighbor and does a lot of things that annoy you? Hi, do they have the right to do that? Maybe. Do you have the right to stop them? Maybe. Is the apartment complex or RA going to take action or not? Will that person listen? What happens if they don't? Is that probably going to be a big gray area? Which means will they still probably do it a bunch? Will you still have to live through it? Will you yell at them? They yell at you? Is that not the outcome? No. That is a horrible outcome because property rights aren't clearly defined. If the RA said, absolutely not. I hear one more complaint. You're evicted. You can stop them. Or they could pay you and say, Endure my music. I like to jam. All right, cool. Make sense? Or they could have property rights and you pay them. Hey, man, don't jam. I'll pay you. I need my sleep. Okay, cool. Do you guys all understand? That's how that works. So easy enough, Coast Theorem. Two things to remember. Clearly defined only works if you have clearly defined property rights and transaction costs are low. That's what this question's getting at. All right. Let's move on to number 17. All right. So this one says quantity of pollution emissions, efficiency of pollution, marginal social cost, marginal social benefit. At $15, they produce 30 tons of pollution. All right. Ready? In the absence of government intervention, the marginal social cost of pollution will exceed the marginal benefit of pollution by... Yeah, okay. So, all right. They're asking you to make an assumption that I don't like that it doesn't say, which is, hey, what does it cost you to actually pollute? If we assume it's nothing, you will pollute until the marginal social benefit is what? Zero. At 45. I'm sorry. The, sorry. 
Yeah, the marginal social benefit is zero at 45 units. You guys understand? It costs you nothing. You just do it until all the benefits used up. And if you did that, what would your marginal social cost be? So the answer is the marginal social cost will exceed the marginal social benefit by 25. Is that? So it's just assuming there's no yeah. benefit? Should it say that? There, and assuming there's no cost of pollution. Yes, and then that question gets a lot easier, right? Because could there be a cost of pollution polluting? Yeah, totally. So, but that's how that one works. That should be added to the question. So that's not going to be on there. Or it'll say that. Yeah. Easy enough. All right, let's do the next one. If this market produced blank tons, then blank. Okay. If it's 30 tons, it would be efficient. Yes. That's it. Okay. Easy enough. Because there's no like. That is the socially optimal quantity. Easy enough. It's where marginal social cost equals marginal benefit. Any quantity greater, it would be inefficient because the cost is greater than the benefit. And any quantity less would be inefficient because the benefit is greater than the cost. And we should pollute. Here's the hard words. More. All right, you have a question? Let's see. Reach an efficient solution only if the negative externalities were offset by positive. No, do we ever do positive and negative together? What? Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't know. All right. The marginal social benefit would be seven dollars. Let's see. At twenty, with the marginal social benefit, the marginal social benefit is which curve? This one or that one? So at, what did it say, 15, 20? 20, it would be way higher. And then at 15, the marginal social benefit would be $5. So at 15, it would be even higher. It's essentially asking, can you read this graph correctly? Because it clearly, that's your marginal social benefit curve. Don't confuse it with the cost curve. That would be, those would be correct if it said marginal social cost would be, they would both be correct. Okay, next one, 19. According to the Coase theorem, okay. Should you guys get this one now? Yeah. Should be easy. Oh, okay. negative externalities are present. A market will always reach an efficient solution. No, the Coase theorem says so long as the number of bargaining parties is large. No, that would be a high transaction cost. Only if government intervenes in the market, does the government need to intervene? They just need to establish property rights. Reach and fish solution. If the negative externalities are offset by the positive, we usually don't play that game. I mean, you could make that argument, but do we ever do both at the same time? Reach and fish solution if transaction costs are low and property rights are clearly defined. That's what it probably should also add, but that's good enough. Can you do 22 at the top? 20. 20? They already asked 20. Oh, oh, 20 as well or 22? 20 as well. Okay, gotcha. All right, sorry. Yep, it's already on the list. So let's see. We have marginal social cost pollution, marginal social benefit pollution. It's got the nice lines there to make life easy for you. Cool. The graph shows marginal social cost, marginal social benefit pollution. What level of pollution represents a level that will be emitted in a market economy without government regulation? All right, pollution. What kind of externality do we have? Negative. So what curve should we draw on this graph? to see the unregulated amount. Will people care about the marginal social costs or will they behave like the private cost is all that matters? So we got to draw a supply curve and the supply curve should be where? Over here or where's the only point over there where any of the lines meet? The price right here at Q3. Oh, you're right, sorry. They're doing the pollution as zero cost thing again, aren't they? So it'd be Q3 or Q4. Uh, it has them both there. If pollution has zero cost of producing it, Q4. So yeah, you got to like, make that assumption again. That's just like if it's an un unregulated market, like there's no government, then they're just going to produce too much, like as much as they can. Well, if it's pollution and we assume that there's no cost to making pollution, then how much pollution would you make? Too much. Until your benefit is gone, right? Yeah. That's it. 
How do you know which curve to like move? Which curve is kind of like your supply curve, which is your marginal private cost plus your marginal your external cost. Uh, for the cost and marginal social cost curve. So that's your supply curve. Yeah. So remember, we okay. add costs and moved it left. So if we took that cost away, we'd move it right, and then we'd draw our supply curve. So we didn't actually have to do that on this one because we're assume pollution. We're assuming there's no cost of polluting it, which. It's a bit of a stretch, but you can make that argument. You guys good? All right, let's do the last one's 22. That's already on the list anyway. The idea that even in the presence of externalities in the economy can always be reach an efficient solution as long as transaction costs making the dollar low and prior rights are clearly defined is the definition of the Coase theorem. Will we get into all these other externality stuffs? Yes, but they are not in this section. All right, 25. The marginal benefit of pollution emissions blank as a quantity of pollution emissions blank. So the benefit will fall as you do more pollution or rise as you do less. So decreases as a quantity of pollution emissions increases. Hey. So like, like, I feel like, can it also not? change because it's the law like of diminishing marginal returns the more you do something the less additional benefit you earn okay. that's that's why if you do more of something think if you could only drive five miles in a day you get a lot of use out of those miles how much if i said you can only drive 10 how much more benefit would you get from that five more some but what would be better the first five what if i said 15 miles a day how much would that extra five miles how much benefit would you get more but less more make sense so the more you do some the less extra benefit you get all right 28. and this Can you use 26? Sorry, <laughs> all right yeah same thing uh marginal cost of pollution blanks is quantity of pollution emissions blanks so the marginal cost is upward sloping. So it's a positive relationship. So it's an increase, increase, decrease, decrease. So there it is, decrease, decrease. C. That's good. So don't forget, read carefully. Benefit, cost. They behave differently. All right, let's look at this one. We've got price per unit. Could be 25, marginal social benefit, marginal social cost. Emission, so it's pollution. All right, if this market produced blank units, then blank. All right, so we just got to go through them all. So if they made 40 units, the marginal social benefit would equal the marginal social cost. No, that would be at 30 units. Okay. <clears throat> if they're at 30 units, marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal social cost. No, they'd equal each other. At 40 units, the marginal social benefit would be less than the marginal social cost. Marginal social benefit would be less than the marginal social cost at 40 units. Yep. At 20, the marginal social cost is greater than marginal social benefit. So at 20 units, the marginal social cost is what? Greater than or less than the marginal social benefit. Read them carefully. What curve is what? That's, that's it. All right. So, no, no, we've got more. Yeah, but that one. Yeah. All right, let's do number 30. Oh. Yeah, I know this one. <laughs> if the current amount of pollution emitted is 150, then the total dead weight loss from blank is equal to blank. All right, current amount of pollution is 150, so we're polluting how much? Too much. Okay. So that means the total dead weight loss is, oh, okay, I'll show you guys how to draw this one because I have a feeling you're like, ah, oh, I don't know how to. Dead weight loss and externalities is like econ student kryptonite. Let me explain. I'll, I'll tell you all the go-tos and how to solve it. So first, let's go ahead and draw our supply or marginal private cost, okay, right there. Now, where is the dead weight loss? The yeah, it's asking where's the dead weight loss? At 150. 
Yeah, at 150. So here's what to think of. This is the quantity we're at. The cost is 150 to get $50 of benefit. Is that efficient? No. In fact, none of these would be efficient until we got to where? Here, which means our deadweight loss is here. So to make this make a little bit more sense to you guys, I like drawing these things like so and going, all right, it's a negative externality. So here's my demand curve, my supply curve. My demand curve is also my marginal private benefit, marginal social benefit. You guys got that? But my supply curve is my private cost and that's my social cost. If I'm unregulated, I will consume too much of the good. So ready for the externality, how to find the dead weight loss? Do you guys remember how you're used to finding it like in between demand and supply? If you have a dead weight loss or an externality, the dead weight loss will be external. So where's that dead weight loss? Is it in that triangle that we're used to? It's outside, external. External dead weight loss, externality dead weight loss is external. And I like to think of it as like a flag post and it points the way the external externality is. Which way is the arrow pointing? This triangle, which way is it pointing if it were a flag? The negative direction. You guys got it? So if we have our spine demand, the dead weight loss will be external and negative. Does that make sense to you guys? That's going to be your key concept for it. All right. Oh, uh, believe. Oh, uh, math. What's the area of the triangle? Base time site. What's the height? Yes, good. What's the width? 50 times 100 is what? 50 times 100? Yes. Uh, but it's a triangle. So that's base times height, but you need to do what? Square it. Square it? <laughs> it's a triangle. How, how do you find the area of a triangle? One half base times height. So you got to half it. So what's half of 5,000? What's half of 5,000? What's half of 50? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. All right, easy enough. So what's the area of the triangle? That is your answer. And just in case I feel like being fun, I'll let you guys all in on this little one. Okay, let's just say I give you the same one and say, what if the market price, there's a positive externality and it's unregulated? Okay, that means my marginal social benefit is my demand curve. So what it means is this. This is my supply curve. It's my marginal private cost and marginal social cost. You guys understand? Positive externality, no negative externality. Supply curve is a supply curve. But my marginal social benefit, I would have a demand curve that would look like this also known as marginal private benefit. Guys got it? Now you're used to having a dead weight loss in that triangle, right? That's not how it's going to work. <clears throat> the rules, and you can write these down if you want. If there's a dead weight loss in externality, the dead weight loss will be what? what? External and pointing the direction of the externality. Positive for positive, negative for negative. So where's the dead weight loss going to be? First, what do we always find? The quantity, and we go up like that. That's our flagpole. If we draw a flagpole, what do we need to draw next? The what? The flag, okay? Except it's gotta be on the pole and it's gotta be pointed in what direction because it's a positive externality, positive direction. You guys got that? So where would we draw it? right there. So, what are the two rules? One. so the rules are this. If you are given a graph, I always go ahead and simplify it and say something like I have my demand or marginal private 
benefit and I have my curve, my supply curve, and I'd have that my margin uh, supply or marginal private cost. Got it? Now, if it's a market with no externality, no deadweight loss, you guys know how to do that. Pick the externality you guys want me to find the deadweight loss for. Positive. Positive. Cool. So, supply is now marginal. Sorry, marginal social cost. Because if there's no external cost, the social cost and the private cost are the same. You guys good with that? Supply curve stays the same. What curve do we need to draw now? We need to kind of shift the demand curve. You guys understand? So which way would the demand curve shift if there's a positive externality? To the right, it increases more benefit, more demand. So we go ahead and call this our marginal social benefit. I mean, you know how far it should go, right? Uh, that far is good, or do you want me to shift it more? Or less? Okay, so it doesn't matter. Well, right. On this one, it does because you have intersecting points. They line it up. Okay, so like that makes the sense. graphs, you go where they intersect? Yeah, and in fact, this one says if it's at 150, all right, that is a negative so, externality. So if it negative. said 50 and there's some positive externality, we got to do this. You guys got it? So how do we find that dead weight loss? Step one, always find what? The quantity. Where's the efficient quantity in this market? Where marginal social costs equals marginal social benefit. That is just like, you don't even have to look. Well, marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. That is it. I said, draw the flagpole. You guys got it? So if that's the case, okay. So that's where we will be socially optimal. You guys got it? But what if we were unregulated? Where would we be if we we're unregulated? We'd be here. Here, I'm gonna even get rid of that guy. Just say what? Okay. Okay, so I'll just go back to here. You guys got it? This is the curve, we're unregulated. And would we have a dead weight loss if we were, were marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit? If, where's the optimal point, the socially optimal point? The marginal social cost equal to marginal. The marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. Do we have a dead weight loss there? No, because no, that's socially optimal, right? But if it was unregulated, would we have a dead weight loss? Yes. So that is here, okay, where we're at marginal private cost. So it was marginal private benefit. Do you see that? So if we are there, you find out where's the unregulated quantity and what's the problem? Well, we'd have, if we were at point X, we'd be getting this much benefit at this cost, but there's all these additional benefits that we'd be losing, right? That's a positive action. So what should it look like if you're like, I kind of get it, but how do you draw it? Draw the flagpole at the quantity. Because remember, we're not at the socio-optimal. We're at the inefficient quantity, the unregulated quantity. Draw the flagpole. And if you recall, we used to draw things like that. And do you remember consumer produce surplus, all that jazz? And you're like, oh, dead weight loss has to be in here. It's an externality. Where is the dead weight loss? External. It's outside of that triangle. Make sense? But it's a positive externality. So think of it as a flag. Which direction does it have to point? Positively. To the right. Does that help you guys out? It's tricky to draw. So like that. Here, I'll do the other one just really quick for you guys. If there was a negative externality, then the supply curve would shift here, and this would be our marginal social cost. 
I'd go ahead and find my unregulated quantity. Where's the unregulated quantity? Where supply equals demand. Where's the dead weight loss? It's external and where? Pointing what direction? Make sense? Does that help you guys out? So negative externality, dead weight loss. You guys got it? Could you just like go like put like number 30 thing you just like put it in there to be like 150 and then like looked at the gap between the two? Just well 150 the gap is 100 and is and then, that yeah, but then the like gap between 100 like your socially optimal point and where you are is 50. So then could you just do one half 50 times 100? Well, yeah, you just found the area of that triangle. Well, that is the answer. So you're saying, Mr. Wildsman, can you just find the dead weight loss and solve for the area of it? Yes. I think you did what I said. You just went, oh, that's 100, and then the gap in between it is 50. And yeah, that's the area of the triangle. It's exactly how you do it. Half based on type. All right, and I think 33, but I bet you guys are good. Co-serum works best when? There it is. All right, that's it, guys. I hope it helped, and I hope you guys do well tomorrow.